I'm gonna do our little intro. Our little, um, hold on, do I have hair on my mouth? Wow. Do I have it? We're coming undone tonight, guys. <laughs> we haven't done this in a while. I think you're all right, babe. Okay. All right, we're back. We took a nice long month off, <laughs> but we haven't actually taken time off. We've been getting ready mm -hmm. because we are gearing up to go weekly, launching this church. <sighs> The Freedom House it's happening. is official, and we're going <laughs> weekly come April 30th. A month from today. At 6 p.m., and we will be there every single Saturday at mm. 6 p.m., so we're super excited. So it's been really hectic. We've been getting a lot of things in order, but good hectic. We're excited, um, but we missed our podcast. We're back, <laughs> and we're better than ever, and we're ready to go. <laughs> and we're humbler than ever, and we are ready to go. Um and we're going to do almost like a, well, we're going to figure out if we actually do this, but we want to do almost like a little series in this next stream of podcasts. Tonight's um, episode one. Tonight's episode one, but not really. I'll probably still keep it episode 10. <laughs> um, but we're going to talk about why is the church remaining silent? Mm. And there's a lot of topics that the church has remained silent on. So we're going to have a lot of podcasts about it. Um, well, those, for those of you that are tuning in live right now with us, feel free to comment what mm -hmm. you believe the church has remained silent about or currently is silent about. Um, mm -hmm. And not just what they're silent about, but what you believe the church should be speaking out about right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. And before you comment, you know, maybe just ask God what's on your heart for mm -hmm. the church to say, because mm -hmm. we don't want to react in our emotions of what we feel like the church should be saying, but what do you believe Jesus wants the church to be speaking about, to have a voice for right now? So if you're with us now, feel free to comment along mm -hmm. with us and uh, we may get to your, your episode soon. Yeah. And, or, and DM or, us on and. Instagram at the freedom house and let us know what are some topics. Mm -hmm. I did a little question poll a couple weeks ago and we had some really good ones that I'm holding on to. I got a few that came in for me too. We're ready to go. Yeah. But if you have extra ones or maybe we'll see a lot of the same ones and you know, some of them might not always feel so controversial. Like we know the obvious ones and we'll get to them, gender and sexuality, abortion, all of that stuff. But tonight we are actually going to talk about something that you might be like, what? But it isn't as common as it should be in the church. So tonight it's missing. We're talking about, I was like handing it to you. <laughs> well, pick it up and hand it to me then. Discipleship. Something that's very near and dear to our hearts, but something that we've also recognized is not happening a lot in the church and is not being yep. spoken about a lot in yep. the church. So share a little bit about, obviously don't name names, um, but just some conversations you've had recently oh, yeah. with different people from all over the country. So don't, you know, it's just from everywhere. Um, what are conversations that you've been having with people when they share what they're missing? And I'll share some as well. Yeah, so first of all, what's interesting is when we did a poll for this recently, we were like, hey, what's not being spoken about in the church? What's the church remaining silent about? Everybody hits the the, the hot topics, mm -hmm. the the LGBTQ plus, and the, I know you're going to mention a couple of them and all that stuff, but that. the majority of people go to the politics route um, or, you know, moral standards, obviously, in America, what's Disney doing these days, all that kind of stuff. But nobody actually responded with something that is not being talked about, just like Dee said, and it's discipleship. And you can read scripture upon scripture upon scripture, and we could probably quote Matthew 28, 19. I know you have it ready to go. But why is it that the church is not talking about discipleship? And I just talked to Dee right before we started this thing tonight, and I was like, you know what? Um, there's a holiday coming up. And in the Christian faith, it's it's the biggest holiday of the year, and that's Easter. It's the Super Bowl, they call it, it in the oh, church world. They, yes, they do. Sorry. The Super they Bowl <laughs> of the church each year, um, which I understand why they do that. It's the biggest day. It's the most attended day. It's a great opportunity for salvations. But this is the struggle that... Um, I believe we have as the church because I've been in ministry for quite a few years now and been in the church for quite a few years now. 
And I've always seen it taught that, hey, for Easter, the biggest day of the year, the most, the most beautiful day for us to celebrate the resurrection of our King of Kings and, and, and our Savior, Jesus Christ, it's the biggest one, right? But we don't teach anybody how to make disciples. We teach them how to invite them to church. Mm -hmm. I was just talking to my friend recently, and I was like, isn't it interesting that we teach people how to invite people out of the darkness to come mm -hmm. into a place that is light, but they don't want to come into the light. But here's the thing. Scripture says that light will enter darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. It's actually supposed to be us that go into the darkness mm -hmm. with the gospel with Jesus Think about to reach that them super literally real quick. Cause you know, we use a lot, our friend Melanie was talking on her story the other day about Christianese terms. And so oh, I got a new one. when you say that, like, obviously we kind of understand what you're talking about believers and this and that, but think even very literally, if you bring someone that has been in a dark room into this bright white arena with lights and the sun, and it's just crazy bright, it's going to be, intimidating and overwhelming and a shock and you know too much but if you walk into a dark room with a lamp or, or a flashlight or, or a candle and you go in there and there's just a different yeah. kind of gentleness or openness or just kind of like a different kind of shift and transition and so yeah like bringing people in sometimes works sure that's great and you know it's funny because we i think as the church especially in America, mm. maybe everywhere, um, really believes like, yeah, church is for the unbelievers. Like someone actually said that to me a couple months ago and, and she was like kind of having a, a complaint or a righteous discontentment as I like to call it about a church. She's like, yeah, but you know, I know the church is for unbelievers. I'm like, well, no, like the church is for the believers, the saints to be equipped to go out and reach the unbelievers. Well, define the church for a minute. Because mm -hmm. when you talk about the church, you're talking about Sunday morning. The mornings. actual Sunday morning service. Sorry. Yeah. Yes. The church. We are the church. Hey, yo. Um, but she was specifically, specifically talking about the church on Sunday morning mm -hmm. services is supposed to cater to unbelievers. But wherever we shifted and made that happen, we've just created this culture where we now have depended. I know we're going to go here, but we have just depended on the pastor, maybe the worship leader maybe one other executive mm. pastor or whoever to just feed us. And then we go on our Monday through Saturday and live the exact same way. Um, and we've missed out on a huge part, which is discipleship. Now you can have your input mm. and your theories. I believe a big part of this is because, um, <laughs> I'll tell you what it is right now. Okay. You tell me and then I'll tell you mine. We don't have a strategy to train people or love people well. And we don't often start with the foundation of loving people. We start with a foundation in church or in, in, in planting churches most of the time of only building a team to accomplish something that can host hundreds or thousands of people and that grows really fast. Mm. But the problem with growing really fast is that the people that joined in the beginning get left behind, they get missed. They don't get discipled even. They don't get loved. We think it's our job to preach from a pulpit every single week, but Jesus oftentimes left the crowds and went to desolate places. Why would he do that? He gained a crowd. Everybody talks about this. We're like, oh, the crowd of 5,000, and that was just the men. That means there was probably mm -hmm. 20,000 with the women and children. And that's beautiful, and I would never discount what the Lord was able to do. But why is it that he would get on a boat and leave them? Mm. why is it that he wouldn't have said, okay, guys, this is it. We got here. Mm -hmm. He even splits them up into fifties and hundreds mm -hmm. before he feeds them. Mm -hmm. So it's like, Hey, we could strategize. And now we have a huge group of people, but he leaves them. And he basically was teaching. Oftentimes there's a cost to discipleship and you have to be willing to leave everything. Mm -hmm. But we build structures for something bigger for events for events and a Sunday morning driven mm -hmm. culture. And mm -hmm. we've seen it time and time again, where you walk in and it feels like it's sheep because they're just getting herded in and herded out for the next group of sheep to come in for the next service. Mm -hmm. But who's loving the sheep? Mm 
-hmm. Who's noticing the one that's got the broken leg? You know, and says, oh, this one needs healing. Mm -hmm. This one needs comfort. This one needs to be taught. You know, like this is a brand new sheep. Who's going to care for this one? Discipleship is has been lost in the church because we have not been looking for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's my thought. You want to hear my theory? Mine's oh, a little, boy. Mine's a little meaner. Oh, wow. <laughs> I think people have gotten to the we point. We know who has the grace in this relationship. So I think, I think, and this is not for everyone, okay, but I have seen this and I could, I could see it happen maybe on purpose, maybe not. Um, I've seen pride creep in and a lack of trust where leaders are unable to trust other people to lead other people. Yeah. And you as the leader feel like you are in control, it, almost like this authoritarian type... Pyramid. Pyramid scheme. Wow. Where you're, you have to... These are your she sheep and you have to shepherd them and they're mm, your people. Mm. And you there's a pride with that and then there's a mistrust of what if I let someone disciple this person yeah. and they lead them astray or they give them bad advice or they say something whatever but instead of raising people who raise people who raise people you are sitting there saying like well they might not be equipped or you know yeah you can't just send anybody joe schmo to go disciple people you have to know that joe schmo is getting discipled by bob the builder. <laughs> I don't know. Wow. But so that's what I think a lot of it is too, is where it's like, it just comes down to, we have exalted these pastors into these positions that we've said, okay, this is our, this is the pastor. And he just leads all of us. And it is literally impossible. Jesus had 12 disciples or 72 really, if you know, but he was Jesus. Yeah. So who's to say that we can run a mega church and shepherd all those people? Well, we can't, it's literally impossible. And unfortunately, the problem that comes from that is that shepherds try to be the old time prophets where only God speaks through them. And you actually end up robbing the people that are in the midst of your congregation or your church because you're not teaching mm -hmm. them how to hear mm -hmm. from the Lord. Yeah. And if you just go back, when Jesus did have all these followers, he appointed the 12 disciples. There were people wanting to follow, but he went and called certain ones to come follow him. And he invested into those people well. So that the next, you know, few chapters later, you're like, oh, wow, there's 72 being sent out two by two, mm -hmm. which means even his 12 disciples were not overseeing all 72 because it wasn't like, hey, each of you take six and right. that would make sense with multiplication. But no, it's like they've been trained up well enough over those, you know, a couple of years or whatever that even 36 groups of two were able to go out. And mm -hmm. some of them, guess what? Made mistakes. Mm -hmm. What? They couldn't cast out demons. Humans? People, people came back with complaints. And of course, Jesus had to teach them and rebuke them and all that stuff. But, but what a great example. Time. Oh, no. sorry. Oh, man. We never finish each other's Sandwich. Thoughts. Oh, well. never mind. Whoa. What a great time to train and to teach people. If yeah. they come back and they fail and they say, we messed up, then that's the time. And think of this even in your own life discipling people or getting discipled that you feel safe enough to go to that person and say, I royally messed this up. I tried to do this. It went this way. And now I'm stuck in this situation. What do I do? There's safety, there's comfort. And that person can then mi like minister and mm -hmm. train and, and disciple yeah. and teach you, no, let, this is how we go towards righteousness. This is how we go towards holiness. And rather than saying, Oh, you failed. Forget it. You're out. Or saying you could fail, so I'm not even going to bother you yeah. putting in that putting you in that position. And you know, a lot of churches have implemented like small groups, and those are great. You know, and some of them, some of them are great. Some of them are probably subpar. But if you're if you don't have, I'm sorry, but surface I mean, level maybe maybe they don't go yeah. deep. But if you don't have a real community and vulnerability where you can actually go deep and and find someone in that circle that can disciple you and they're being discipled um then yeah you're just you're just hanging out you know <laughs> i know that's harsh but it's like i feel like a lot of believers a lot of us are at the point now and we're seeing so many things happen, not only in the world, but even in the Christian world, we're seeing things happen with churches and pastors and all of this stuff that I believe a lot of us are at the point now where we're like, all right, something's got to give. 
this model of church that we've been doing the past probably couple decades is not working. Yeah. And I think it's, it's, we've kind of skated by, but now the times that we're living in, we have to go deeper. We have to be more like Jesus than ever before. And Jesus discipled people. And so to not live in that model yeah. is we're being hypocritical. We're not being like Christ. Perfect time to read some scripture, babe. Way to lead me read there. Read it in. Ecclesiastes chapter three says this, for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. We have to catch that. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. There's a time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. There's a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to, to cast away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. There's a time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. I read all of that because we need to see that even the church can be in seasons. Like you go back, what, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, there were massive crusades happening in America, thousands upon thousands of salvations. Look at Billy Graham. It was not being done like that. And really, it hasn't really mm -hmm. been done like that much since. I've seen a few things pop up here and there, but nothing like that which is okay because there are different seasons. And then you go to the early 2000s, there was a different season of church and everybody saw this model of church and how it was supposed to be. And we all copied it and tried to become like they were. Well, maybe that season has come to an end. Please. Maybe this is the season of discipleship. Mm -hmm. And here's where it begins. For everyone who is listening to this right now, you are waiting for your church to establish something that you have been called to do. Ooh, say that again. You are waiting for your church to establish something that mm -hmm. you have been called mm -hmm. to do. You, I know you have it already, Matthew 28, 19. It's one of my favorite verses. Read that one and verse 20. Ready? Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Mm. So that call was given to literally all of the disciples. And honestly, anybody who else they talked to. Hey, what was the last thing Jesus said before he ascended on the clouds? He said, go make disciples of all nations, teaching them to do everything that I commanded them, baptizing them. And it's so funny because I have had people ask me like, oh, hey, like, what do you have to do to baptize people? Like, do you have to be ordained? Do you have to be this? And it's like... You have to be a believer. Um, what do you have to do to be able to cast out demons? You got to be a believer. <laughs> yes, there is also fasting and praying that comes along with everything you do. But what do you have to do to be able to heal people? You just got to be a believer. Go look at when Jesus called and appointed the 12 disciples. He gave them the authority to cast out demons and to heal people. And obviously, we know he sent them out all the time. But... He gave that to them right away. Mm. He appointed them and said, now you're my disciples. You're following me. Go. Here's the authority I'm giving you is to be able to do X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you, did you receive that authority or did you not? Or did your pastor receive that authority, but you did not? Mm. This, this scripture right here, I don't hear it preached very often because I think it might cause fear for some people. But in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, and two, it says, long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, which is true and good. And God still uses the prophetic today. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. That's so beautiful for me because I just see a church full of people who have maybe been relying on somebody like a prophet 
Like they even treat their pastor like the prophet that hears from the Lord for them. Mm. But you've been robbed of just the one-on-one direct line, mm-hmm. direct line of communication mm-hmm. between you mm-hmm. and Jesus, which is how he desires to speak today. So if he's speaking to all of us, not just the church leadership, to go and make disciples, mm-hmm. are you going to be held accountable for that responsibility? Right. Well, yeah, give examples of how that can be very dangerous, too. Like having, looking, because there's, there's one thing to respect people that, you know, have a call of God on their life and, and what, the, what God has gifted them in. But where does the, lo- the line draw between having respect for these people and viewing them as like the man of God <laughs> or that they are the ones that hear from God? And like, where does that get messy or mm-hmm. where have you seen that become problematic for people or is it just yeah. that line that once they get crossed and it goes from a respect to yeah you know i think more. what i've seen happen a lot with people that are like highly revered like above others even though we're all just human beings and we're all children of god and brothers and sisters in christ is you have these people who look up to people and that is totally okay to admire someone. To admire, yeah, to, to look to them as an someone. example. Yes. Paul says, hey, imitate me as I imitate Christ. That's a heavy statement, y'all. Literally watch what I do and imitate me because I know that I'm imitating Christ. This is what happens, I think, and this is where there's unhealthy people or unhealthy leaders and healthy leaders. Unhealthy leaders are where people will look up to them and be like, wow, look at how much they love Jesus and love people. Again, all good things. But the unhealthy leader will look down to them and be like, yes. And like, mm. that's kind of the role is like, yes, like I that, am this person. Right, that authoritarian. If you want to meet with me, you have to go through X, Y, and Z to get mm-hmm. here. Mm-hmm. I am the person. I am the most highly revered person in this church. No, you're not. It's Jesus. Mm-hmm. The healthy person, uh-huh. same situation. They have people who look up to them. Wow, you you are such a great example of Jesus to me. You love people. You love me. <laughs> and that person doesn't look down to them, but they look up yes. and they lift up. Uh-huh. You look up to me and you see what I have. Let me lift you up and help yeah. send you to go do what God's called you to do. Because there's going to be people for them that are going to look up to them. Uh-huh. And that's okay. Because Mm -hmm. God even models that when he gives Jesus the name above all other names. And Jesus says, my father, he's the one who speaks and I do what he says and what I've only seen him do. And the spirit, like they all lift each other up and humble themselves before each other. It's like, it doesn't even make sense sometimes. It doesn't make sense. But if we're supposed to imitate God, Mm -hmm. then guess what? If you exalt yourself as a leader over people. The word's very clear. You will be humbled. Mm -hmm. But if you humble yourself, Mm -hmm. take the least seat. Take the least amount of credit for what gets done. That's when God exalts those people. Mm -hmm. And that's the beautiful place for for healthy leaders. Yes, I agree. Sorry, we're fixing our phone. You should shut your ringer off too because it keeps dinging. I don't know. It keeps dinging. Sorry. So you had a dinging look, Rachel, dinging <laughs> um, Yes, that was, and that's so beautiful, Miles, especially, and, and I can just attest that that is something that my husband does very, very well. Anyone who's met him and had coffee with him knows that he, you are such a people mobilizer oh, and you love pushing people into their calling, even if they're like, wait, wait, wait. He's like, no, just go. go. <laughs> <laughs> we try to push people. <laughs> they don't even want Kevin. He's like, I'm not going anywhere. Um, But that is the sign of a true leader. That is the sign of someone who is imitating Jesus and is being like our king who who came down from heaven and and became flesh, became like us when he did not need to uh, and paid the ultimate price and all that, laid down his life. Um, That's who we want to imitate. So the Bible says the greater love has no man than to lay down your life for your friends, just to, to be that person for others to, to say like, at the end of the day, like my name doesn't matter. It doesn't. Mm-hmm. But what can I do in your life to help you fall more in love with Jesus and really walk in his calling? You know, cause we've seen it, we've seen it abused and we've seen it manipulated where people have, 
felt a certain way, wanted to do a certain thing, ministry or make a move or something, and their leaders haven't agreed. I mean, I can think of literally like nine people off the top of my head in different scenarios in different churches. I'm not thinking of one pastor. Yeah. And where pastors have said things like, well, I don't agree, or I didn't hear from the Lord on that, or you don't have my blessing, or you're being rebellious, and things like that. Yeah. Like, rebellion is an actual evil thing that should not be done, but to throw the word rebellion on something that's just going against what a man wants is not what the Bible is talking about, so be very careful with that. But when that is shared from leaders in position of power that are maybe abusing their power, that's when you have to know, like, I have to hear from God for myself because at the end of the day, it would be great to be affirmed by man. Mm -hmm. It'd be wonderful. But that is not what hangs in the balance here. It is, did God speak and are you going to obey? That's it at the end of the day. There's nothing else that matters. Everything else will fall into place with men or it won't. <laughs> and, that, and again, it doesn't really matter because if you're being obedient, the Lord is going to provide and he's going to favor you and he's going to open the right doors. And even more than that, you're going to be living in his will and his call. Mm. And so I'm, we're kind of going on a rabbit trail, but kind of not because when you have good disciples in your life, people that are discipling you and that will say that, because here's the thing. Miles and I both disciple people. If one of my girls came to me, women, they're all women, but whatever. But if one of my girls came to me and said, I feel the Lord is saying this. I have fasted. I have prayed. I am so confident about it. I'm moving to Nebraska. Okay. I don't want any of my girls to move to Nebraska right now. (laughs) Let's just say that. If I felt like, oh, wow, I don't know if this is really the best choice. Have I fasted and prayed about it? Mm. Have I spent hours interceding on their behalf? Have I weighed out all of the options for them? Have I heard from the Lord for them? And if I haven't, which, you know, more than most likely, I haven't. Who's praying about Nebraska? (laughs) No offense. Here's the real question. Is that even your responsibility? No, no, no. It's not. Well, I know, but I know what I'm yeah, saying. Yeah, it's but not our responsibility. It's not our responsibility, people. but because of those things, because this person is saying, this is what I'm hearing from God, here's the thing, at the end of the day, if she misses God, okay, you know, but I'm not going to sit there and say, I don't have a good feeling about that. I don't have peace about that. Have you ever heard that one? I don't have peace about it. And it's like, okay, if I don't have peace about it, but she does, who the heck am I? I will disciple you. I will love you. And you know what? If you crash and burn, I will be here for you to help you pick up the pieces and say like, all right, let's figure this out. Now what? Let's get you home from Nebraska (laughs) and let's figure this out. But yeah, it's not like we put too much responsibility on people in leadership that they have to be the ones that decide. Yeah. So don't get into a relationship of discipleship that's unhealthy that you begin to get manipulated and distracted. Yeah. Get into a place of discipleship. And I'm not saying don't have people that won't speak truth into your life and won't challenge you and won't correct you. That's not what I'm saying. No, that's, that's discipleship just, is that's discipline. Disciple, <laughs> right. it's, it's love. But you know what? You can do that with people that you truly love because they know that you love them. It's, if it's yeah. all discipline and correct, correcting, that's a red flag. If it's all yes men, you're the coolest, great, good job, that's a red flag. Like there has to be a balance just like any normal relationship. I mean, Paul said it and we've, we've heard this abused and misused, but it's also a beautiful thing. He said that there are thousands, you have thousands of leaders, but very few fathers. Mm -hmm. Then you have to just define what is, what does it mean to be a father? What does it mean to be a good father? You think if you have kids and they're growing up and you're, you are preparing them for life. You're not controlling them, although you do have to tell them when they can and cannot do stuff. Right. But when they reach a certain age and they're no longer uh, a child and they're now an adult and they want to go to college and you disagree with where they want to go to college, guess what? They have freedom to make that decision. And a good, loving parent will see the desire of their child to go to that college instead of that one. And they'll want to get behind them and support them. 
That's what it means to be a good father and mother. When you are in that kind of a relationship, I believe you should look for that when you are looking to be discipled by somebody. Will they be like a healthy father or mother to me? And if so, here's what a healthy father and mother does. We look at our children and we don't try to push our dreams onto yeah. them or Ooh, yeah. hold on. We don't try to make them carry the weight of our dreams so that it's a little bit lighter for us. Yeah. We pray mm -hmm. for our children because we want them to live out the call of God on their lives. And we pray that they would hear God's voice so that when that time comes, they can say, I heard the Lord, Dad. I heard the Lord, Mom. He told me this, and this is what I know I'm supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And then we can do whatever we possibly can mm -hmm. to help them go and live it. Mm -hmm. That's what it means to be a good father and mother. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of person you should be looking for to disciple you. And that's the kind of person that you should try to be when you're trying to disciple somebody else. Mm -hmm. Not who can I find to like just drop all my wisdom on because we're all not that smart. Let's get real. But who can I find that doesn't have anybody to champion the call of God in their lives? Mm -hmm. And how can I be placed in their life mm -hmm. to help them? Mm -hmm. It's the selfless act. What did Jesus gain by discipling his disciples? Mm. He was, he's God. I'm pretty sure he could have done it all alone, by the way. Mm -hmm. But he was showing us how it was meant to be done. And he was showing us how much he loves us. Mm -hmm. Did you see what Juliet said? She said, Aww. that's D for me. Precious. I have such an honor of discipling seven incredible young women. And seven is a lot, I think, for the average Joe Schmo. <laughs> but... I'm full-time ministry, so I can do it. Um, but we really encourage the people that we pour into to find one or two people that they can pour into and they can disciple. And Juliet is, is pouring into our next generation in worship and mm. going to start raising up people. And, and so it's really cool to see that, re not reciprocated, just repeated down the line. And you know what's so funny is like I feel even more, like when I see Juliet succeed, there's just this like beaming pride. Like I'm so proud of her. I'm so, I love her so much. It's almost like I'm more excited for her than when something happens for me. Oh yeah. But now when I see her do that for a girl and I see that girl succeed, like when we see, you know, these girls leading worship in youth and Juliet teaching and training and pouring into them, that's going to like shatter my heart in the best way, you know? And so that's where discipleship, even though you don't really quote unquote get anything in return the return is just the reward it's, the fruit. it's just the fruit of of seeing people walk in his will and it's mm -hmm. like oh yeah what else matters i feel more fulfilled going to a freedom house in another house led by somebody else yes yeah watching them lead than i ever did leading the one in our own home mm -hmm. like i was doing that because that's what i felt called to do and served but I feel so much more fulfilled when I, I helped activate somebody else in the faith to go and live out the call of God in their lives. And now I just get to watch God use them. Are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. That's why Jesus, he was celebrating when he said, you're going to go on and do greater works than these. Mm -hmm. He was already telling his disciples, hey, I've reached this many. Mm -hmm. You're going to do greater things. And look what happened the day of Pentecost. They get filled with the Holy Spirit. Next thing you know, 3,000 people come to Jesus that day in the faith. I mean, and God was celebrating that. He celebrates one over the yeah. 99. How much How much celebration was happening in heaven with 3,000 coming to know well, the Lord? And that's what's so cool, too, about seeing other people walk in that, is those people are now reaching people that you are not unable to reach, but can't reach in the same way can't minister Absolutely to not. in yeah. the same way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think of some of our different Freedom House leaders um, that actually have church in their house as well. And we have one starting where it's just for, like, um, kingdom businesses, like business men and women. And it's like, that's not us. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> we're bastards. Yeah. So they're going to reach people that we can't reach. And so that's just one example. But yeah. And so that's that's the beauty of equipping people is now we get to see them pour into lives and and connect with people that those people might like us and love us and 
come to our church and li- listen to our sermons, but there's just a different kind yeah. of connection in that, yeah. in that home environment. So I do want to give you a quick example, just because I feel like some people might be watching and be like, okay, yeah, this is, this all sounds really great in theory, but I don't have someone that I can disciple or I don't have someone that can disciple me mm-hmm. or whatever. And I'm going to put her on blast, but she won't mind because she's my best friend, uh, one of my best friends. But a couple weeks ago, our best friends, JoJo and JR, were here. Um, and they were just sharing about, like, they're looking for community. And they're looking and they're looking and they can't find it. And they're going to these churches and they can't find it. And they're trying this th- and they can't find it. And so Miles <laughs> just so kindly is like said, then start it. <laughs> and she was like, what? And he said, start what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. And so she was really inspired by that, her and JR, and went home and literally their very first little house church, they, they worshiped together, they prayed, they anointed their house with oil, they shared scripture together, they talked about it. It was them, the husband and the wife, and their two little daughters. Mm -hmm. And now they're going to have another one this Friday night with like three other couples Already. And so, and again, it's not about number and quantity. It's about the quality of the people that are coming and they're good quality people too. But it's about, you've been waiting for something that you're supposed to be doing. And so if that is you listening to this, like, I want that, but it's not here. It's not in my city. It's not in my state. Mm. Then do it. Mm. You don't have to be a church plant. You don't have to be a 501c3, which is a whole other story. We'll talk about you that later. don't have to be, you know, a ministry with the. It's just invite people over yeah. and worship and pray and read the word together and be vulnerable and be honest and be like Jesus. Jesus hung out with people, he loved people. Just go do the same thing. Mm-hmm. Don't overcomplicate it. We have overcomplicated the church system. Yeah. That's Strip so it all away and say, okay, what can I do that I'm looking for that I can pioneer and start? Yep. Oftentimes, when you see a need in the church, not everybody is seeing that need. Yeah. And the Lord has chosen to reveal it to you, not to complain and bicker and get frustrated that the church isn't doing it, but maybe he just revealed it to you so that you would have it on your heart enough to go and do it. Yeah. Go and do it. So I challenge every single person listening right now that if you don't have anybody discipling you right now, um, I would attempt to find somebody. Um, somebody who's been somewhat of a mentor to you or somebody you have a relationship with that you're close with. And if you can't think of anyone, start praying for that person. Yes. Truly. We did. And we got it. A couple times over. I have incredible Absolutely. people in our lives now. Yes. And so th- that's not too weird or big of a thing to ask for the Lord. I'll tell you this. There are ways that you can find somebody if you're like, man, I just can't find anybody that I can really hit it off with. Or like, nobody has time or blah, 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 whatever. Our marriage counselor, he started that way and has now become our ministry coach and now has become basically the one who disciples us together. Mm-hmm. He knows the word better than anybody I know in the world. Like he's 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 amazing. Um, but he has like discipled us now. Mm-hmm. That is so like unconventional of a way to have somebody to start discipling you. But we recognize it very quickly. This man is not just a counselor. He is make he is discipling us. He's pouring yeah. into us. And he and yeah, you know, at first we we were paying him <laughs> to do it. It was pretty great <laughs> service. I mean, um, whatever. It was an open door. But I was so thankful for that. But now, because we're being poured into, it's so much easier for us to pour into others. Oh, yeah. And so I would say, like, yes, if you're going to go and make disciples, it would be great to have somebody. But if you can't find somebody, the Lord still called you not to be discipled, but to go and make disciples. Mm-hmm. So, yes, it's be, it's great to be poured into mm-hmm. and you need it. Mm-hmm. I would challenge you to have that first. But if you wait five years... That's five years without discipling anybody because you couldn't find somebody. Guess what? They can't find anybody either because you're not available to them. Exactly. And another thing that we've kind of adapted here, um, I I just like to call it, well, we call ourselves soul sisters, but we have this little group (laughs) of women. I had to make a name for my guys. It's just, there's just four of us. And it's kind of like an iron sharpens iron group. So that's what ours is called. Is it really? No, my other one. Did you name your text group that? That's, no? that's my other two guys. Anyway, it's just a time where the four of us get together. We usually just have breakfast or lunch. And 
that's where it's not just like, oh, okay, Nicole is discipling the rest of us. It's we literally just do life together and one of us is struggling and the other three lifts that one up or if we're all doing great, we celebrate each other. If we're all crumbling, we try to speak life and pray for each other. And so same thing. So don't, I'm just trying to give you options for like what this realistically looks like for you to where if it's like, okay, I don't need this one person pouring into me, but I really, I know like my friend knows the word and we get along and it's like, start there, have like an iron sharpens iron Mm. crew. And I want to put a little shameless plug in there too. Brian, who is the greatest counselor on the planet, who disciples us, who knows the word better than anyone, who is the best marriage counselor in the world, will actually be at our marriage retreat in <laughs> June. So if you are interested in joining us, this is for anyone. You can come from anywhere in the country. It's going to be in Texas. Dallas on June 24th through 26th. Um, you can DM us, and I'll get you all the information. But if you want to invest in your marriage, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you come with us because it's yeah. going to be really really incredible but i'm i loved i really enjoyed this yeah this I mean, was the easy one i feel like yeah. these are going to get the, a little hectic might, the next ones might get a little heated but we might get right. censored <laughs> on some of them i'll say this and then we'll get out of here for the night um we've kind of started off talking about how the, the church is in different seasons and eras and all that stuff i believe with all my heart that discipleship is that next era for the yes. church yeah. That there is a time for everything under heaven mm-hmm. and yeah. there's a season for everything. I believe this is, we are going to enter into a season of making disciples because there's a couple things Jesus is waiting for before he comes back. One, he's got to hear from the Father. And two, we have to reach the ends of the earth with the gospel. It has to happen. There's going to be a lot of stuff that happens, rumors of wars and wars, but the, the gospel must reach everywhere. And I've heard it said before that if one person or to make two disciples every year, okay? And the next year, you start making two new ones, and those two that you made last year made two the next year, and you followed that pattern. In 31 years, you would reach the ends of the earth. Every single person would have been discipled by somebody else. Mm. It's not through creating big churches and big strategies of, of, of reaching just this, this city, but, but through discipleship, it's multiplication, not addition. It's yeah. the way God increases. Mm-hmm. Be fruitful and, and add. Nope. Be fruitful and multiply. So if you are one person, which I hope that's what you are. <laughs> Who knows in this world? <laughs> We'll talk about that next people. week, I'm but sorry, you're right. one person. Oh Lord! I'm Lord. sure in the next few years, some people will be identifying as four, six people. I don't know, whatever. <laughs> I identify as one. Oh my gosh. Um, anyways, but that means that you are at this point challenged to make at least two disciples because that's how you multiply. So the challenge must be accepted. That's up to you. Amen. 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 I identify as one. <laughs> <laughs>